that's it. Okay, welcome back everyone. I hope you all are enjoying uh, the summer school as much as, as I am so far. Uh, and of course, it's in such a beautiful spot. How can we not enjoy our, our surroundings and, and our hosts? So um, I'd like to pick up uh, where we left off last time. Uh, we were just uh, getting a sense of how interferometers work, how they inter in interacted with gravitational waves. So my main goal for us to, uh, to accomplish today is to follow through on the calculation that Felix Perani taught Ray Weiss how to do that explains how a gravitational wave interacts with an interferometer, how an interferometer's output responds to a gravitational wave. And I'd like to do it in what I consider a straightforward manner, but then I would like to question whether we have left out something crucial. And the, the name that, that I give to that questioning is the rubber ruler puzzle. Whether the question, whether uh, the effect of the gravitational wave on th uh, the freely falling mirrors in the interferometer and uh, the effect on the light don't somehow cancel. And I would like to convince you that no, they don't cancel, uh, and an interferometer works as uh, Pirani and then Weiss told us it did. And I think that will leave us time still for me to accomplish one of my main goals of my time here with you all this week, and that is to cause you to question deep in your soul whether, given the numbers involved in uh, the strengths of gravitational waves and their interaction with detectors, whether it could possibly be possible for us to detect them or not. And my assertion is, if you've not spent at least one half hour of your life convinced that this whole thing must be a giant mistake, then you don't deserve to be then appreciating how fabulous it is that, that we've uh, accomplished this. Now, if that goes all swimmingly fast, I've got some more material, but I'm expecting that other material to wait a day. And nothing would make me happier than to have at least as many questions as we had yesterday, if not more, so that it's difficult for me to cover uh, all, all my material. Um, so take that as an encouragement. Before I actually get into this material, I realized that there were a few things I wanted to make sure everyone understood about uh, gravitational waveforms and how they tell the story of the source. So here's the key expression that says uh, the time history of the gravitational wave strain H is up to these constants the time history of the second time derivative of the mass quadrupole moment of the source. And I then went on to assert that there was this generic pattern uh, that indicated, not only indicated qualitatively that we were seeing gravitational waves from a binary star system, but told us a lot of facts about that binary star system. But I did not pause sufficiently, I think, to make sure that everyone understood several of the amazing things that are encoded in that pattern, in that graphical version of the equation that I had on my previous slide. For example, let's make sure we understand this. So I'm going to mime a binary system with my two fists in orbit around each other, and let's think about the mass quadrupole moment from two massive objects. Mass quadrupole moment is proportional to m times uh, r, r squared, like this. Okay, When we go through a quarter of an orbit, we've got the same strength quadrupole, but with the opposite sign. Here, it's back to the original sign again. Opposite sign, original sign. So we get, for every orbit, two cycles in the gravitational waveform. Now, ponder what that means. We can read off the orbital period by reading off the period 
of the gravitational waveform and just correct for the factor of two that we get two cycles here for every orbital cycle and link that with the fact that the signal from GW150914, a 30 sol 36 solar mass black hole orbiting and then colliding with a 29 solar mass black hole, exhibited frequencies we could hear up to about 200 hertz, which means at the end of its evolution, 30 solar masses was going around 30 solar masses every 10 milliseconds. Just let that sink in, okay? It's pretty fantastic. Um, what else can we learn? Well, um, that pattern persists until a catastrophe happens, until the two stars, by some definition of colliding, colliding, uh, collide with one another. The frequency at which this happens gives an indication of how big those objects are. So you can more or less directly read out uh, at what separation that uh, orbiting process stops and quivering of a new object begins. Um, let's see what else we learn from that. Oh, I think I did remember to mention that the overall mass scale can be read off by the rate of frequency evolution because a more massive system, all else being equal, is a uh, more powerful radiator of energy in the form of gravitational waves. And that's what drives the change of the orbit away from Keplerian Newtonian stability into this chirping form. So the rate at which uh, the frequency changes is telling you the rate at which the orbital period changes, tells you the luminosity, which tells you the mass scale. And detailed analysis of accelerations in that change tell you things like the mass ratio. So enco encoded in that waveform is a huge amount of information if you want the details, but at whatever level you want to stop with your intuition, there's a tremendous amount of intuition that jumps out from that. Uh, so it really is the case, I claim, that uh, those waveforms tell the story of uh, the gravitational wave source in a pretty unique and profound way. And now that I've gone back and tried to remember everything I should have said yesterday. Let me ask if there are any other things that people hoped I would say about that waveform yesterday. Remembering that you will have a whole other set of lectures on gravitational wave sources later in the week. Okay, if not, then we will go on. So, um, let's talk a bit of relativity. You all are being taught uh, uh, by people much more expert than I in uh, general relativity, but I can speak it a little bit, so I will do my best. So the, um, the space-time metric here in the vicinity of the uh, detector that ca uh, characterizes a gravitational wave can be approximated by saying that metric is the Minkowski flat space metric plus uh, uh, a small perturbation where that perturbation must have this form if what we're describing is a wave propagating in the z direction. So I've got t, x, y, and z uh, coordinates in uh, over here. And the shape of that perturbation for a wave propagating in z has no perturbation along z and also no perturbation in, in the time components. It's only in the X and Y components and only allowed to be in this particular pattern where you can have equal and opposite small perturbations uh, along the uh, in the X, X, and Y, Y directions and cross terms can be uh, a separate number uh, in, in the x, y, and, and y, x terms. And let me show you diagrammatically what this means. I showed you this, this diagram a lot yesterday. That shows we've got 
perturbations, and here I've got one standing in in the sense of something like a, a unit tensor, but these really need to be very small numbers and nothing like, nothing like a one there. So this is the pattern of uh, spatial distortion associated with what's called the plus polarization. And the orthogonal polarization is rotated by 45 degrees, and it's called the cross polarization. And orthogonality coming from a 45 degree rotation is uh, an indication of the spin to character, if you like to speak that way. Um, but you can see, for example, that if I look at the motions of masses with respect to the one in the center that I'm taking to be at rest, there is no X change in the separation of those uh, masses from the center one. It's only that way. So that's the sense in which it's perpendicular to the plus polarization. So for the most part, I'll just pick the plus polarization to focus on. Of course, what defines X and Y are the axes, the two perpendicular axes of my interferometer. Plunk them down, and we always call one X and the other Y, and it kind of doesn't matter what orientation they have on the globe, we, we call it plus, uh, pl call those the X and Y axes. Um, what I'd like us to do with that as, as background is to work out the calculation that Ray Weiss did in 1972 after Weber's papers had led him to Pirani's 19 1956 paper and see if we can figure out how much change there is in the travel time of light down the X arm, down the Y arm, what the difference is, and then see how that translates into a change in the output power. So the key idea is to write down the interval and it has a very simple form if, as we will want to do to start, we just want to start by paying attention to what goes on in the X arm. So all we need from the gravitational wave perturbation is the XX, or I wrote it here, 1-1. One, one. Sorry for switching notation on you all. And then to remember that any two events along the path of a beam of light are separated by a zero interval. And that tells us the relationship between dt and dx. So I see pens out and paper uh, out. So why don't we try to work our way through this calculation? It's not very hard uh, if we don't lose things. So uh, how about if we start by everyone writing this statement and let's see how simple the algebra is to, to get the calculation. So we know that this combination of dt and dx is zero because we're dealing with sets of events along the path of a light ray. And what I want in the end is a statement about light travel time down the X arm and a separate statement about light travel time down the Y arm. So how about if we next put T on one side of an equal sign and uh, X on, uh, and the X on the other side of the equal sign. Um, okay, Are, is that a good useful form for, for doing integrals yet? No. What should I do to make it uh, something more useful that will invite me to, to write an integral sign? Take the square root. Okay. Now, is that as simple as I could possibly make a square root given that h is a very, very small number compared to 1? No, what should I do? Yeah, how about that? Yes, 
Okay? Now, is that inviting an integral sign to live on both sides of that equation? Yeah? And we will integrate from 0 to x equals L. I'm going to let my um, mirror at the end of the x arm define what I mean by x equals L. And I'm going to allow myself to insist that that's a good relativistic thing because I'm also going to assert um, and justify it gradually later that I know how to make a mirror behave as if it is a free mass and I'm going to set up a coordinate system where the coordinates are marked by free objects. So clue is I'm going to hang it from wires. I will justify why that is a, a good approximation to freedom for this, for this purpose. So the integral will go from x equals 0 out to x equals capital L. And from t equals 0, if you like, to t corresponding to one-way travel. So there's that integral again. And it's a pretty simple integral to do. And you learn that the one-way travel time is just what you would normally think for going from x equals 0 to x equals L plus a tiny piece, which is just um, h over 2 times L over C. That's the additional time that the presence of, I should have said, an assumed constant gravitational wave or effectively constant during that light travel time adds to the travel time for the light on the outbound direction. Now, what's going to happen, um, what's going to happen next? Light is going to be bounced off that mirror come back to the beam splitter. So we will get a total round trip perturbation to the ordinary round trip time. We'll get an extra increment of time if uh, the gravitational wave has, has the instantaneous polarization such that we, s we said that the X arm is lengthened. We lose that factor of two. Uh, from the round trip, and we get an increment of travel time of h times L over C. Now, the y arm, the algebra is identical, except because of the polarization properties of a gravitational wave, the metric perturbation in the y direction has the opposite sign. Therefore, the time shift, the shift in the round trip light travel time in the y direction has the same magnitude but the opposite sign. And so if we're interested in how much difference in light travel time there is between the x and y arms, we subtract x from y, the negative sign becomes adding this, the, 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 the same effect and we get the total time shift between x and y round trip times of 2 times the strain h times L over C, the, the basic one-way light travel time in the arm. And because what we're doing with these two beams that have arrived at different, after different amounts of times have elapsed, um, in their round trips, then we can reinterpret that. Well, the light does it for us. That means there's a phase difference that has accrued due to the presence of the gravitational wave. And the phase difference is just uh, that time difference divided by the oscillation period of, uh, of the light beam that is illuminating the, uh, the interferometer. And so if we had picked, say, for example, as we do, this as our operating point when no gravitational wave was arriving, the presence of a gravitational wave causes there to be a, a, a phase difference between the beams that wasn't there before. 
And then if we're talking about an oscillatory wave, then half a cycle later, we have the opposite phase difference added and back and forth. And what this graph is, is a graph of the output power from the dark port in this case, as a function of the phase difference between the beams. So we see that a phase change corresponds to a change in the light power that comes out. Obvious or questions? Did I go too fast or is it just belaboring the obvious? Please, Phil. No, no, no. Our, in our lab frame, in the coordinates that we're choosing, this is a very nice choice to say that's what I mean by L. Okay. Now, I could, of course, say I want a different coordinate system, the coordinate system that most experimental physicists would use, namely define coordinates by rigid rods. And I could do that, and in that coordinate system, I would have to say that, oh, the mirror moved, and what I'm seeing is the result of the X mirror moving a little bit farther away from the middle and the Y mirror uh, moving closer. What's observable is the same thing. It's observable by the interferometer is just the change, the, the change in light travel time difference. Yes. We let us let us let us hold that thought, but very close. It will come. It'll come. I will give you an answer almost immediately. Um, yes. All right. While we've got this graph up here, does anyone want to question why I'm insisting that this is a really good operating point? Thank you, Tom. What what do you propose as a better operating point? <laughs> Absolutely. That's what any sensible experimental physicist would propose. Until you think about some of the of the difficulties and some of the opportunities. There's a difficulty removed and an opportunity presented by moving here. But let's make sure we see the wisdom of this before I trash this idea. So the wisdom of Tom's suggestion is that the slope of this transduction coefficient from phase difference to power, it's the largest here. And what I'm looking to measure is a change in light power. So I ought to go where the change is biggest for a given phase difference in order to get the best sensitivity. Is that I've expressed your idea. Ex excellent. It's also nicely linear, too. That's right. Now, I will perhaps just before dinner today, no, just before 7, I won't keep anyone past 7, or tomorrow be explaining that um, the fundamental limit to the precision with which we can measure a change in power is the, I'll call it a quantum effect in light called shot noise. It turns out that although the characteristic, the slope of this characteristic curve is highest here, the shot noise is higher. If you're down here, the slope is lower, the shot noise is lower. A miracle happens and the ratio of signal to noise is in fact the same along that curve. It's a, it's a miracle. I've done the algebra. I believe it. I don't have a good hand-waving way of explaining it. But the real reason, there, but there are actually, given that we have th that miraculous freedom to choose without needing to use your good idea, it turns out that there are two good reasons to be down here. And I will sketch them now and probably come back to them bef before our, our time is up. First of all, if we uh, have, as most light sources do, have fluctuations in brightness 
that are in excess of the shot noise. They, in fact, are stronger here where the, the light is stronger. But even more importantly than that, there is a wonderful trick that we will use to massively enhance the sensitivity of our interferometer that we can use when we send almost no light out of the output port and send almost all of the light that returns because a beam splitter, after all, has two ports. The light comes back to the beam splitter. There's a reflection from X and a transmission from Y. That's the port we're talking about. But there's also transmission from X and reflection from Y that is back to the direction of the laser. Picking this as our operating point for the port we've been talking about means almost all of the light is being sent back toward the laser, which laser physicists would say, oh, no, please don't, please don't, because it tends to make lasers ill behave to send that light back into their uh, oscillating cavity. However, we can capture that light and send it back in, and with a tremendously clever trick called power recycling, use that light over and over and over again as if we had a laser with up to 50 or 100 times as much power as the laser we paid for. Okay, And with extra power, we get a benefit against shot noise. So there's all these good technical reasons to live down here, but I wanted to make sure that everyone saw why you would think that this makes sense. This is in many ways making sense, yeah. Yes. Oh, yes. You definitely don't want to be precisely here. Okay. Now, original versions centered the operating point precisely there, but applied an RF oscillation. And then if you've got that constant extra phase shift oscillating, when you're precisely centered, you see a brightness fluctuation at precisely twice that oscillation frequency. But as soon as you have a gravitational wave that pushes you off center, then that oscillation gives you a component at the modulation frequency. And it turns out that that's its amplitude is completely linear. What we do now is have a DC oscillation, just offset it a tiny bit. Um, okay. For historical reasons, that's sometimes how we think of it, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, twice the power, I can sketch that. Okay. Right. So it's easy to sketch the power part. It's not so easy to sketch the noise. The, that power would grow by a factor of two. The noise would grow by a factor of root two as I'll talk when I get to it, but may as well refer to it now. So we would win as the square root of the power increase, basically. I'll be demonstrating that in a more leisurely way later. Um, now, um, maybe I'm ready to go to another slide. So I want to uh, interpret what we just did as saying, okay, we figured out about the life travel time and this is the same change in light travel time that we would have uh, thought we would have gotten from a fractional length change of just h over 2. And now I can say where that factor of 2 came from. It was from the fact that the metric perturbation is h, but that is next to a dx squared. And so getting rid of the, the, the squared with uh, uh, is what brings in that, that 2 in the denominator. And in this gauge that I'd like to uh, think about often, although not always, we interpret, that, we interpret that as saying there was no actual motion of any mass, but that the metric of the space, in particular the length of the space between two fixed coordinate points changed, okay? That is an interpretation that, uh, that makes some sense. And I'll link that with some 
other similar kinds of coordinate descriptions of other physics situations in a moment. Now, as, as Bill said, we might instead have chosen a more sensible coordinate system, namely one defined by rigid rods. And with respect to coordinates defined by rigid rods, you could see those masses moving. So they either do or don't move depending on how you want to describe the physics, but the measurement of an interferometer comes out just the same. You just have to pick a coordinate system and switch, switch to it. Now, if instead of trying to motivate the most convenient ways to think about an interferometer, I was trying to motivate the most convenient ways to think about Joe Weber's original gravitational wave detector, um, which involved two test masses, if you will, connected by a spring. So I had to constantly be aware of other forces other than gravitational effects. Then turning the gravitational effect from the gravitational wave into an equivalent force actually makes it simpler to get through to the end of the calculation, to compare the gravitational effect to the restoring force from the stretching of the midpoint of the bar and its elastic modulus. And so whenever Weber wrote about things, he didn't like this TT gauge. He said, look, I can show you what is the differential force between the two ends from the Riemann tensor. And so now I can apply that as a driving term on the right-hand side of an of, of an equation of a harmonic oscillator, and I can tell you how much that harmonic oscillator is excited. So either can be correct, so long as you uh, know which language you're using and, and stick to it. Okay, now I'm ready to return to that question that you asked a moment ago. And here's one way of phrasing it, and please tell me if this is the version of the question that you, we're asking or if it's, a, if it's a different one. So the question is, isn't there an effect both on the light and on the test masses? And if so, isn't the gravitational wave somehow made unobservable? Let's think that through. Um, I call this the rubber ruler puzzle because the intuition that motivates the question is, okay, I've filled the arm of an interferometer with a light wave and it has, you know, pick a wave front every wave crest, okay? Those are the tick marks on the ruler. And when space is expanded by the action of the gravitational waves, is it not the case that the separations between those tick marks on my ruler have lengthened? And if my ruler stretches every bit as much as the arm, it would seem that I have constructed a situation uh, where the effect of the gravitational wave is unobservable. Is that your question? Or is, did you have a different one? Mm -hmm. it's, <laughs> it's so much easier now than it was three years ago. <laughs> I, I suppose so. I cannot display that for you. Okay, but I am prepared to walk us through this version of the worry. Raise your hand if either today or at some time in the recent past you've had this worry. Okay, good. All right, so let's talk it through together and make sure we see uh, why, although that's a legitimate worry, in the end it's not a legitimate problem. All right, so I'd like to make an analogy to another physical system that I've, I've found really useful in getting my own understanding of the straight. And it's another physical system where we've gotten used to marking coordinates with free masses. Namely, it's the use of so-called co-moving coordinates in the description of the expanding universe. 
we mark the coordinates usually in describing cosmology by the locations of galaxies. Now, they don't have to be, happen to be plopped on a grid, but it doesn't really matter. And so they are freely falling objects. They are responding to gravitational effect and to very good approximation, nothing else. And let's think what we know about how things work in an expanding universe. We know that as the universe expands, galaxies get farther apart by whatever means you would use to, to establish um, their, their separation. You also know that the light that is traveling through that expanding space has its wavelength lengthened and lengthened by precisely the same factor as we say the separations of the galaxies are being lengthened. That's the cosmological redshift. That's how, in this case, we actually see that uh, the lengths are growing because we see, um, see the stretching of the light waves. Now, we might debate if it were worth the time whether we ought to say that galaxies are moving in an expanding universe. We can surely take any one galaxy, we usually take ours because we love it best, say, okay, we're not moving, but everyone else is moving away from us. But we also know that we could equally well choose any other galaxy and take it to be the thing that we say is not moving. And in fact, the only way you can get an answer to how fast another galaxy is moving, say, is how fast is it moving with respect to the galaxy we choose, usually ours, as, as a reference point. So it's, it's a kind of a, uh, becomes a theological dispute whether you want to say that there is motion in an expanding universe or not. And like many theological disputes, I've seen a lot of heat um, uh, generated by uh, how, how to say what one thinks is the right answer. Um, but it's not the most important thing. What's the most important thing is that we know and have a built up a lot of intuition about another physical system where we mark uh, coordinates with free masses and then we make measurements by the passage of light signals through the system. Now, The key thing to continuing to motivate the puzzle before we dispose of it is to say, well, boy, light traveling through an expanding universe is being stretched by the change in the scale factor. It is the case, yes, here's where I want to be. It is also the case in an interferometer. And here's how you can see it. So. What I would like to do is I think we can do this just with two arms. So let's make this a reflecting mirror at the end of the X arm and this a beam splitter. So here is the situation um, as we've set up the apparatus um, and no gravitational wave has yet arrived. Now, I find it easiest to go through this argument by imagining a very special kind of waveform for the gravitational wave. I think it's simplest, and I think at the end we can see my argument won't depend on the particular temporal character of the waveform. But I'd like us to... Think about h of t as a step function. Okay. No gravitational wave arrives, and suddenly there is a permanent lengthening of the x arm and a permanent shrinking of the y arm. Makes drawing diagrams uh, easiest. So what I will have is after the arrival of the step, so after t equals t naught, suddenly 
my arm is longer. And it stays longer for the rest of the situation that I want to analyze. So let's think about the light wave in the arm. And I want to draw it first for the situation just before T naught. And this is like every billionth wave crest in the beam. It must be the case that at t equals t naught plus the tiniest increment, that the wave fronts move in the same proportion. So that a wave front that was immediately adjacent to the beam splitter is still immediately adjacent to the beam splitter. A wave front that was immediately adjacent to the surface of the mirror at the end of the arm was, is still immediately adjacent to that arm and that everything moves proportionally in between. If that were not the case, we would the only other way you could invent a rule would be to have some background space-time. And there is no such thing. So precisely, and this is precisely the same effect that happens in an expanding universe. So I've changed the scale factor of my arm and all the light is stretched by the same scale factor. Now, there's actually two sets of light waves in this arm. There's the outbound light and there's the inbound light. Same diagram applies to both. Now, the same thing happens, of course, with the opposite sign in the Y arm. So there was a wave crest immediately adjacent to the beam splitter, and it is with the tiniest of perturbations still immediately adjacent to the beam splitter. Now let's ask the question for the light that's returning to the beam splitter, what is the phase difference or the travel, let's, we're talking completely in the time domain, let's talk about the travel time difference between the light that went in the X arm and the Y arm and what it looks like after T equals zero equals T naught. These beams that were just about to reach the beam splitter and superpose have changed negligibly. So immediately after T equals T naught, there is no travel time difference impressed between the light in the X arm and the Y arm. Uh-oh, are we about to get in trouble? No, because if we wait a little while, it's this beam, this wave crest, and this wave crest that make it back here. But this one wa is going to come back a little late because when the gravitational wave arrived, it got moved away from the beam splitter, and this one got advanced. So we wait a little bit, and we start to see an effect. Wait a little longer. This one got closer, this one got farther. Okay, their difference is a little more. Wait a little longer. There's a bigger effect here. And this effect builds up until we've waited a long enough time so that light that was just entering the arms has had a chance to go all the way down and all the way back. And such a wave crest samples fully the lengthened arm. And so over a time that is a duration, the round trip light travel time in the arm, the response goes from no response to the full naive response. And forever after, in the assumption that this was a true step function, 
we have new fresh light of the wavelength that that laser produces traveling through a lengthened arm, traveling through a shortened arm. And so this stays constant as what you would have naively calculated as the response of an interferometer. So when we had those night sweats about whether an interferometer worked or whether the stretching of the light um, was uh, making the effect unobservable, we were guilty of not thinking about the fact that light is traveling and we were imagining that these tick marks were a frozen ruler. And if they were a frozen ruler, yes, then the rubber ruler worry would have been a genuine worry and nothing is observable. But since these tick marks are just marking things that travel at the speed of light through the space that they find themselves in, then all we have learned, but it's actually something worth having learned, is that an interferometer doesn't respond instantaneously, but responds over a time equal to the round trip light travel time in the arm. If we were sophisticated, we might have guessed this. And in fact, um, people who love to do their physics in the frequency domain, I have been such a person from time to time, actually calculated the frequency domain version of this response decades ago without realizing that, oh yeah, if I put that in the time domain, I can explain the rubber ruler puzzle. Um, this is just what you expect. Now, what that tells me is that um, oops. A, we don't care about the instantaneous response very much. We care about this whole response function. And so we've learned, okay, we don't have perfect fidelity in our measurement. We've got a little bit of, of high frequency roll off, if you like to speak in frequency domain terms, or a little bit of a delay. But really what we have um, finally learned is that um, here's my takeaway. We never should have said, we never should have allowed ourselves to be tricked into thinking we were using light as a ruler. We always said from Pirani onwards we were using light to measure the light travel time between adjacent freely falling objects. And the light travel time calculations had been done correctly from Weiss onwards, and they were always going to be correct. And it was just a matter of making sure we didn't get tripped up in our heuristic interpretation by momentarily thinking that, that light is being used as a ruler. It's not. It's being used as uh, a travel time measuring device and a travel time measuring device only. So that's my account of how the rubber ruler puzzle is, is resolved. Yes? Yes. Um, well, for technical reasons, I think there are polarimeters at several key places. If, if I understand the literature that you're referring to correctly, the effects on polarization are really small, are they not? Um, so um, if, yeah, so I don't, I don't think there's, there's any interestingly measurable effect from a change in, in the polarization. Now here's how it could be in principle, right? If there were a differential change in the polarization of the light in the X and Y arms, then when you came to superpose them and do the interference, you wouldn't get a, a strong an interference effect, okay? But I, thi I think those are, those are incredibly weak effects. 
Okay. Uh -huh. Happens to the light. Great. Okay. Any other either remarks or questions about this? Yes. Mm hmm. N almost. It means that the interferometer is with this waveform applied to it, permanently stretched in X and squeezed in Y. The light is not stretched, no fresh light. The only light that gets stretched or squeezed by the gravitational effect is the light that was traveling through the vacuum at the time. The new light coming from the laser is coming out as a single wave front before hitting the beam splitter every period established by the laser's cavity. That's a good clock. And now it gets here and it leaves simul the beam slitter simultaneously in both directions and the new light is not stretched. Okay, But the new light does feel either the longer arm or the shorter arm and so its response becomes this permanent offset. Okay, good. Great, thanks. Thanks for, uh, for, for asking that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Right. Right. And and none of this is intended to say that you can't think in that other frequency regime. This is only like the, the simple enough way to, to make sure that you don't get confused. And in that higher frequency regime, let's just talk this out to make sure everyone has, has thought it through. Um, okay. So this mirror is oscillating, if we've got an oscillating gravitational wave, in a time that is short compared to the travel time. So what you see as the total time shift in uh, the travel time of any given wave crest isn't the um, h times the round trip light travel time, but something smaller. Right. Yes. Too bad, but that's how optics works. Um. That sounds right. Yeah, we could do it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. It's rolled off at a kilohertz because of the response of the arm cavities. But in fact, at say two kilohertz, we're getting the optimum response one could have done from a matched length for two kilohertz. There's another miraculous bit of algebra that says when you do your multiple round trips that I haven't talked about yet, um, uh, when you do your, your beam folding with a fabry pearl cavity, it magically makes it so that it, you get the same response as if you had pro precisely chosen the length for, for each frequency. That's not true for something with discrete bounces. As Nelson knows as well as, as, as I do, there are nulls in the response as there are nulls in LISA, which is a out and back uh, trip alone. But uh, when you superpose round trips in a Fabry Pro cavity, if those words mean something to you, great. If not, I'll explain it later. Um, then uh, um, it's, it's not really a roll-off that you, it's not any additional roll-off. It's just the roll-off associated with the uh, effect that you're not benefiting from any more length than, um, than half a period of, of the gravitational wave. 
All right, shall we move on? Okay. Um, here is a slide that I showed last, uh, last time, yesterday afternoon, and I wanted to dwell on it a bit more by way of introduction to uh, the scale of actual gravitational wave detectors and some of the challenges that we face. But I think you all let me get by without questioning why I was so certain that, oh, well, Weiss did the numbers and showed that this could be much more sensitive than a bar. We can understand why with very simple reasoning, and let's just make sure that, that we pause to, to do that reasoning. Um, I think it's obvious, and I might even have said so, that uh, Weiss envisioned already in 1972 that the arm lengths could be kilometers long. That's more important than you might think at first for the comparison with bars. Here is the argument that Weiss made explicitly, I believe, in an appendix to this, to this 1972 article. You might ask, okay, so Weiss is ambitious. He thinks he can get a lot of money, so he wants to build interferometers really long. Well, I believe in bars. I'm going to make a really long bar. You can't, and not just because, you know, you would bankrupt the entire aluminum industry to try to get a bar that long. The length of a bar is intimately tied to the frequency at which you want to use its resonance to give this resonance enhancement, which turns out to be the only very narrow band of frequencies at which the sensitivity is, is close to being useful. And that frequency is set by the speed of sound in the aluminum or whatever other material you would use to make the bar. Now, aluminum has a nice speed of sound. There's some materials a little faster. Doesn't matter. The range of speeds of sound in, in, uh, in metals or crystals or anything you might think you would make a resonator out of um, is not that large. So if you're interested in looking for gravitational wave signals around a kilohertz, you're talking about a maximum useful separation between your test masses on the order of a few meters. Of course, if you're interested in 100 hertz and with the benefit of hindsight, we say, okay, 100 hertz maybe would have been a better choice. Okay, you can make it longer, a few tens of meters. But you don't improve your sensitivity by making a bar bigger because what you do then is just drive your resonant frequency lower and you picked a target. So whatever your target frequency is, the length is uh, the length that uh, corresponds to having a lowest resonant frequency uh, at the, the frequency that you've chosen. So bars are very limited in their length. In principle, I can build an interferometer as long as I want. Lisa's going to build a really long one, of course, as Bill was explaining. Okay, you don't continue to uh, gain a benefit from longer arms if you go to the extreme. However, you are allowed to build a much longer arm because the extreme at which you no longer gain is something where it's the round trip light travel time as opposed to the round trip sound travel time that, uh, that limits you. So you can make an interferometer longer than a bar by a factor of the ratio of the speed of light to the speed of sound in whatever material you want. And that's a big factor for all materials that we know. And there's a, there's a hidden part of the argument that I'm not saying, but I will say now because Weiss made it explicit. That's a way to make the signal bigger by a factor of speed of light over speed of sound. You still have to ask yourself, well, what about the noise? Is the noise bigger or smaller? And in fact, most of the, say, mechanical noise sources that you struggle with are um, things that, that affect an individual mass where it is and don't grow with length. And therefore, making 
the signal bigger, the overall stretch bigger, is not just something that's on paper, but it's actually making it bigger with respect to a fixed amplitude of, say, thermal noise. And therefore, it became, after Weiss made this argument, obvious that interferometers were better because they were the only ones that you could, in principle, make bigger. And it's precisely uh, four kilometers, as it turned out we could afford, um, three in Europe, um, over one or two meters. That's the ratio that you get for free. It's not free. It's for free in the physics. Very, very expensive, right? Okay. And uh, I'll call you in just a second. Do remember that one of the amazing advantages of Weber's bar and what made it possible for so many people to check his work was a group of five physicists working for a year with a few tens of thousands of dollars could make a bar. What have been the expenditures on interferometers integrated over the history from idea to success, about a billion dollars in the US alone. And I'll let Europeans uh, tell me what the number is in, in, in euros within a factor of two or three, it's the same, right? So uh, these are the world's biggest scare quotes when I say for free. Um, but it's a genuine physics advantage to, to an interferometer. Yes. It is mostly build, well, it to, to first order, it is building materials. Um, there are some things that make it, make costs grow slightly more than linearly or eventually a lot more than linearly. Diffraction causes laser beams to spread out. And so uh, diameters of things have to grow like the square root of the length. Um, for various interesting technical reasons, these, the light paths need to be level at both ends. That becomes gradually a worse and worse approximation as you go longer on the curved Earth, plus the expense of preparing a straight path on the surface of the Earth as you go longer, Earth's curvature suddenly starts to become really important. So there's a variety of reasons why um, a few kilometers were chosen. In Weiss's earliest dreams, it was going to be 10 kilometers. And then he said, no, nah, I'll compromise and we'll make it five. And there was a ridiculous moment in the history of LIGO when way too early, NSF wanted a cost number. They got a cost number from LIGO. In retrospect, it was low by a factor of 10, okay? We thought it was correct, but it was wrong, all right? NSF said, no, we can't afford that. You've got to hit this target. That target was reached by shrinking the arms from five kilometers to four. And that's why LIGO was built as a four kilometer interferometer for a completely bogus cost estimate against a completely bogus cost limit. Um, all right, what can I say? I don't know the story of why Virgo is three kilometers. Maybe someone can and tell us over, over beer. Um, all right, but the length is the essential good idea. It's the main good idea. The other good idea is that because you don't use a resonance, you can uh, easily see that you could read it out and get faithful recordings of H of T, whereas all the data analysis strategies applied to bars couldn't tell you anything about H of T. They could just uh, say, okay, some energy went through near my resonant frequency around then, where the time resolution wasn't even that, that great. So that, that's the other really important argument, but it was at least in the early days, and we now know it had to be. The sensitivity argument was king. And we just barely crossed into, you know, a couple years ago, the regime where, uh, sensitivity was good enough. So we are allowed to make the masses very far apart. Kilometers works fine. We need to make the masses be as free as they can be from disturbances. And it's very helpful for them to be free enough that 
arguments that I made about, oh, they're good markers of coordinates in a transverse traceless gauge, that, that that works out. We implement that idea by having the masses be more or less free in the horizontal directions, and the only one that's really important is along the optical axes. And you do that by making the masses. I'll show you these first, and then I'll explain the masses. So here is what a four kilometer Michelson interferometer looks like. You have to take a picture from the air. This is the one in Louisiana. This is the one in Washington State. They are more or less identical, and yet I can, in my sleep, tell which picture is which. You can too. Here is the most beautiful interferometer in the world, uh, Virgo at Kashina. That's what a three kilometer interferometer looks like. Um, this is a far cry from what Michelson originally did, and recall it's also a far cry from the investment that Weber had to make to start, to start the field. Now, here is an implementation of Pirani's prescription that I should be measuring the relative accelerations between neighboring freely falling test particles. This is one of advanced LIGO's mirrors. Believe it or not, that's what an ultra-high reflectivity mirror looks like if the ultra-high reflectivity has uh, been achieved only at a very narrow wavelength range, which is, <coughs> excuse me, the way it's, it's done with uh, multi-layer dielectric coatings. So even though to our eye it looks like almost transparent and just a little yellow at the wavelength of the laser, that's a 0.9999 reflectivity mirror. What you can't quite see in this slide, but I think you can see, yes, you can see here is that that mirror, here it's got a protective cover on it, so don't pay attention to that. That is the test mass with the reflected coating. It's not sitting on the ground. It's also not literally freely falling. We do not drop our mirrors. They're, you know, $100,000 each. There was about a week in my life when a very respected colleague of mine said, you know, it's so hard to make these suspensions work and to solve these noise things. Why don't we just, like, drop the mirrors over and over and you know, just pick them up and drop them? Said, no, no, no. And we didn't do that. Um, okay, so here is a photograph, and here is a CAD drawing that lets you see what this photograph of actual apparatus looks like. There is the test mass. It's suspended by fine fibers, which in advanced LIGO, as in advanced Virgo, are fused silica, that is glass, drawn into a very fine fiber. I'll explain later in our time together, not today, why fused silica is the material of choice. The other ends of those fibers are attached to this object that looks very much like a mirror. It doesn't need the same optical properties. It, in turn, is suspended from more mass, which is, in turn, suspended by wires from more mass and more mass. Um, even a single pendulum is a good prescription for making a mass that is more or less free in terms of its response to a time-dependent force. brought some demo apparatus to prove this point. My statement is not true at low frequencies. At low frequencies, there is a restoring force that my finger feels. So it's not the case at frequencies low compared to the resonant frequency that those mirrors are free. However, if I apply a very rapidly oscillating force, what's limiting the response of this mass is not a restoring force from this spring. Pendulum is a spring. It's the inertia of the mass. So as long as we are thinking about gravitational waves whose main frequency content is above the one hertz resonant frequency, of that mirror, we have made something that is a pretty good approximation to a freely falling object in that direction. 
the reason for the long chain of mass, spring, mass, spring, mass, spring, has nothing to do with wanting a mass that is free to respond to the gravitational effect as, as, as if it were truly free. That is all the rest of this work is part of the very important job that I'll be describing later of keeping the vibrations from the environment in which this apparatus is installed, keeping those vibrations from showing up here. This is the world's second best engineered mechanical isolator. The first best is at Virgo. Um, this, is, this is pretty good as well. Yes, yes. This is the one that's farthest from the ground th through paths of material. Okay. Now, this all sits in a vacuum chamber. Uh, part of the reason that these things are so expensive is that there are one meter diameter high vacuum pipes that connect all the optics to all the other optics along the full lengths. Okay. That's very expensive. That's done for many reasons, but among them is um, it guarantees that sound waves don't shake shake the mirrors. That's probably reason number three or four for vacuum, but it's it would be enough even if the others weren't more important. Let's see, what else do I want you to see right now? So the scale of this is pretty big. That test particle is, in the advanced LIGO case, 40 centimeters in diameter. It's a very, very expensive piece of very good glass, polished to incredibly uh, f tight tolerances, figured to incredibly tight tolerances, coated with coatings that are, by several figures of merit, the best coatings ever made. So that gives you a sense of what Weiss ended up proposing. I'm not sure, in fact, I know he didn't realize it was going to be this complicated because if he had realized, we would have known that estimating a cost of $60 million was ridiculous. But yes, Eric. Um, it, it is not to be a mirror at all, but it's more inertia. Um, so I will anticipate something that I will have prepared slides for later by just explaining the basic idea. Um, here's a mass on the ground. Ground is shaking up and down. The mass moves as much as the ground does. That's a bad idea. The ground shakes up and down by about a micrometer. I'll, you'll understand how bad that number is uh, either right before we go to dinner or not much afterwards. What about if instead I build a frame and hang that mass from a spring? Then the ground moves up and down this moves up and down at low frequencies compared to the resonance. It goes crazy at the resonance. We have to deal with that. But for frequencies of vibration that are large compared with the resonant frequency, this mass is effectively still, and the spring just stretches. And that's a better and better approximation for frequencies that are higher and higher with respect to the resonance. That's good, but it's not good enough. That's better. That's better still. How many stages in the super attenuator? Seven, okay. Um, you can do better and better and better depending on your ingenuity, your patience. There's lots of challenges to making this work well. But the basic idea of why you have the thing you want to be free connected by something compliant to a bunch of inertia, more compliance, more inertia, is uh, is this idea that I will make mathematically uh, explicit uh, in a in a future lecture, Tom? Um, it's a way of getting something that has the same density, the same mass. It's it's a it's it's a trick that's I it's inessential. Okay. It's, 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 it is inessential. Um, and you can see that it's inessential because we only did it once. 
here's some more mass and whatever. Well, no, 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 it's not that. Okay. Um, does it have to look like that? No, but it does play a role of a place that we grab and in a way that's, I would say, is very analogous to a marionette, which is a word that isn't a technical word in LIGO, but it is in, in Virgo. It's a way of applying control forces that position and orient the mirror, but where you've got one stage of isolation between the noise in the, in the forcer. I can't tell you why it looks so much like that. that I think that's uh, a highly inessential feature. Um, in fact, I know it's inessential because if I were showing you the equivalent Virgo diagram, there's something that plays that same inertial role and a very similar control role, and, but it looks nothing like a mirror. I just don't remember the history of why, why LIGO made that precise choice. Um, here's one other photograph of a bit of hardware. Um, this is the light source. This is the, the laser that illuminates um, um, one of the LIGO interferometers. And this laser is in principle capable of putting out 200 watts of highly stabilized power. It won't be before dinner today, but it will be tomorrow. We'll see why the power is such an important figure of merit. Nevertheless, I have to say, most people in LIGO think we will never turn it up to 11 for some very good physics reasons that became clear as things, things went on. If you don't know the reference, you should watch the movie This is Spinal Tap. Raise your hand if you have seen the movie This is Spinal Tap. Too few hands. Every physicist, whether you like heavy metal music or not, needs to, there are three or four of the best physics jokes ever in that movie. Um. Okay, uh, so you get a sense of why $60 million was a crazy number and why an integrated cost of a billion dollars turned out to be a more realistic number. That's, I think, all I'll have to say this week about costs. All right, now I want to ruin your supper by trying to convince you that you ought to believe that this is impossible if you know some physics, which everyone in this room does, okay? Now, what do we need to build a gravitational wave detector? We need test masses, a set of them. We're using, f call it three. Um, you'll see why I waffled on that in, in a little while. You need some instrumentation that can see the tiny relative motions caused by a gravitational wave. And you need isolation, as we started to see, from other causes of motions of those mirrors that without proper engineering would be much larger than the small motions applied by gravitational waves. Now, I have been pulling a cheat on everyone in this room for the entire time you've been listening to me yesterday and today because every time I showed you a diagram of a gravitational wave, I showed you one with a strain of order several percent. What a joke. What nature provides us is not one part in 10 or one part in 100, but one part in 10 to the 21. Let that number sink in. And this was a guess for a long time, and it has been retrospectively validated that that was how far we had to get. So. Let's think what these requirements are actually asking us to do. They are asking us to see strains of 10 to the minus 21, which you've, if you turn them into arm length changes over a four kilometer, three kilometer distance, doesn't matter, turns into relative motions between mirrors at two ends of an arm of about 10 to the minus 18 meters. Does that sound all right? It shouldn't. 
What's the diameter of a proton? Yeah. All right. So we're talking one part in a thousand of the diameter of a proton is the thing we now do routinely. And until we could do it routinely, you couldn't see anything. How is that even possible for light with a wavelength of a micron bouncing off of material bodies made out of atoms? What's the diameter of an atom? Yes. Okay. And they're not atomically smooth even. Okay, they're not. A, how is this possible? Why are you guys believing this? <laughs> All right. In the presence of much larger noise, the one where I can quote the biggest number by contrast with 10 to the minus 18 meters is the RMS motion of the ground. Any place you pick, you'll be within an order of magnitude if you say it's about one micrometer. So. My isolation system, my mechanical isolation system for my mirrors, 10 to the 10, 10 to the 11, 10 to the 12, it's frequency dependent amplitude, as I'll make clear. But we're talking 10 or more orders of magnitude of vibration isolation. Um, that's one of a number of noise sources. We'll be looking at, at, at several of them, but they're all huge. The signal is tiny by any standard, by any reference you would like to um, compare it to. And I'll mention one other thing that is more of a technical challenge than one that should be obvious to any physicist, but it's one that actually is a big challenge. Um, when the Michelson interferometer, oh, where, don't have that slide yet. When the Michelson interferometer was invented, you will see by tomorrow, a reminder of what Michelson and Morley built in 1887. The most important figure of merit that they had to achieve before they could achieve their earth-shattering scientific result was to make sure that the mirrors were bolted to as rigid a structure as possible. And they knew that if they weren't bolted to as rigid a structure as possible, the mirrors wouldn't stay aligned or if they stayed aligned, they would drift, and the signal would go all over. So they went to tremendous effort to, um, uh, to make this rigid structure. And if you go into any optics lab in the world, most of what you will see is not mirrors or lasers. Most of what you will see is rigid mirror mounts, okay, for which people pay several hundred dollars a piece. Right? We can't do that. We have to have our mirrors be test masses for a very weak gravitational effect. So they have to be free. Except if they're free, then they don't aim in the right place and they don't sit in the right place. You can't pick that operating point. They swing around and you see sinusoidal responses to, okay? And it's nuts. This is nuts. How is this possible? All right, can we see signals of order 10 to the minus 21? Well, I, let's make a number to show how hard it is. Um, we're doing interference. We're using light with a wavelength of um, a micrometer. So the natural um, distinction you can make is between constructive and destructive interference. So that's a change of path length difference of half a micron. So it's in round trips, it's motion of mirrors of a quarter of a micron or something. All right, well, even Michelson could, could divide the difference between bright and dark, but he couldn't do it very well. He could tell the difference between bright and dark of at about a tenth. All right, so if you take um, uh, something like a tenth or a twentieth of a wavelength and divide it by uh, of a wavelength of a micrometer and divide it by four kilometers, what you get is strain sensitivity of 10 to the minus 9. Not 10 to the minus 21. We're off by 12 orders of magnitude. Right, right, but the but the, the, the length for this purpose, it didn't matter, is just 
how finely he could split a fringe, okay? Oh, oh, you're right. Yeah, yeah, I, yes, it was right. It was, I, 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 I'm misquoting the wrong thing. Right, so, so we get a few orders of magnitude. I said it wrong, thanks for, thanks for the correction. Um, it, we, we get a few orders of magnitude from our length, but only a few orders of magnitude. We're still off by um, um, eight, eight orders of magnitude, I think. Okay, now, we already talked through this, this argument. Mirrors are made out of lumps of 10 to the minus 10 meters, um, and they're not perfect. And furthermore, those atoms don't just sit there, they jitter around. Now, what are some of the sources of jitter? Some are uh, operating on the atom by atom scale, and some are on more mic um, uh, macroscopic scales. Seismic noise, roughly speaking, a micrometer amplitude. Can we filter enough? Yes, but you shouldn't believe me, okay, until you've worked it out. How about the Brownian motion? of our 40 kilogram Brownian particles. Everyone remember little dust particles that you can look in a microscope that jitter around in the case of dust particles in a drop of water that you look at in a microscope because of random collisions of uh, water molecules that are moving because the water is at 300 Kelvin. Well, our mirrors are part of a 300 Kelvin heat bath they're not being bombarded by either water molecules or air molecules. But nevertheless, the thermodynamics that governs the strength of the jittering turns out to be just about the same. And if you make the numbers for how much the center of mass of the mirror moves, it's much bigger than 10 to the minus 18 meters. And if you ask how much does the mirror surface move, it's smaller, but... Um, mirror surface with respect to the center of mass, smaller but still large compared with 10 to the minus 18 meters. And there is no such thing as filtering. This is noise that's actually happening in the mirror. No. No. I will explain the trick, but it will, it, I, I think you will find it more surprising in that it comes from a stranger corner of physics, but I think it, w it, will, it will be clear. W I will make it clear, but not before dinner, because we're almost ready to go to dinner. Um, okay. Um, here's my picture of the Michelson-Morley apparatus from 1887. They paid a draftsman for a number of hours of work to carefully draw in the details of their mirror mounts. That shows you how proud Michelson was of his ability to make rigid ways to hold mirrors. Um, we don't do that, but we need the same effect. We need our mirrors to stay still to a very high degree of precision and to stay pointed to a very high degree of precision without being held by rigid material objects. Yes, yes. Well, the, the bearing was mercury. So, so I don't, this, this was, uh, I, I, I think it was granite. I don't know what this, uh, rigid bearing material was, but it did have a, a, a moat, a circular trough in there that was filled with mercury and, and it sat in that. And that was because they needed to make a differential measurement by reorienting their, their apparatus and they needed a, a, a smooth way to turn that, that massive thing. Yes, yeah, so, so good memory on that. Um, okay, um, we have made it work, I assure you. Um, you can not lose your supper. You can uh, relax and enjoy it. Um, we did find signals with a peak strain of 10 to the minus 21 with a cumulative signal to noise ratio of more than 20. But until we get together tomorrow, you should be asking yourself, how, how 
as is possible. Okay, and then I will try to lead you out of that confusion tomorrow. Yes. <laughs> okay, well, there are talks coming, right. And in fact, by Friday, Stefan Hill will be talking about m an effort to give an answer to that question that's been done with much more thought than I personally have, been given, uh, have given it. But let me remind you that Virgo folks can fill in the equivalent Virgo number. Right now, the uh, LIGO is still between a factor of two and three below the sensitivity we thought it could achieve when we figured out all the different sources of noise. So we hope in the very near future for that side of the ocean, a factor of between two and three. Virgo is how far from dis four to five. So there are immediate prospects for very noticeable improvements that will make much better astronomical measurements very soon. So that's one kind of answer. The other kind of answer is what you'll learn from Stefan Hild on, on Friday, and I won't try to anticipate them other than their grand plans, but they sound like they have a lot of good thought behind them. Yeah, we call it third generation. Yeah. Right. Any other questions before we go to dinner? Okay. Um, enjoy your dinner in spite of the worries. Yeah. <laughs>